and we are live so i'm sitting here with vintage miranda also known as the host of a uh, kawaii uh kawaii millennial on youtube how are you doing today i'm doing fine how are you i'm doing all right so this was a bit of a last minute uh planned out thing on my part so i apologize for that but if you'd like to introduce yourself and some of the things you've done uh feel free to do so Sure. Um, so my name online is Miss Miranda. Uh, I did change it to the Kauai Millennial, but I was trying to change it back to Miss Miranda because I felt it was more fitting. I was trying to go in a different like area, but it, I don't feel like it worked. Um, so I do um, interviews on my channel. Uh, so I interview various different people. And I also just do discussions as well. So if anyone wants to have discussions on uh, any political or social like uh, uh, discussion, like I'm, I'm up for it. Um, I also do like YouTube poop every now and again. So like if I feel like just doing like a silly video of like uh, Dave Rubin uh, and like Jordan Peterson strikes again, like I would do that, you know. Um, so that's pretty much what I do. Uh, but I want to lean more towards making like vlogs now. I want to have a bit more fun, uh, a, a bit more fun with my channel because I feel like sometimes it gets a bit too serious. Um, so I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much me, and I also work, uh, I have a job working with the homeless. Yeah, and I, I just did a little bit of background check on you, like in terms of like your website and your discussions, and I was wondering how did you kind of get into this kind of online commentary, because I know you mentioned how you kind of want to have fun, and your recent channel introduction kind of has that vibe of want to still engage in some of that serious stuff, but at the same time, being able to take a step back and really enjoy the content that you're creating. Hmm. Well, initially, uh, I started back in like, I believe 2015 to 2016. Um, I started my channel as this like centrist channel because uh, I'll be honest, uh, cringe worthy time right now to, to mention this, but I used to do, I used to be into centrist stuff. I used to watch Blair White. I used to watch Shoe on Head. I used to watch those type of people. And I'm just, I cringe right now thinking about it. Um, but that's how I initially started it. And the reason I started it in the very beginning uh, was actually two reasons. Uh, one reason in particular was I, I do get a bit of stage fright. I, I don't like people looking at me. And this goes like straight into like just walking down the street. If someone just happens to stare at me, I get a bit, I get a bit like bothered by it. Mm. Uh, and I thought that starting a YouTube channel would be like a very helpful with like just getting over that fear. Um, and the second reason was because I started to really get into politics and uh, a lot with like the uh, Donald Trump election um, and getting into arguments with my dad <laughs> really uh, got me into the groove to be like, you know what, might as well just start making videos on this. And I started making like, uh, let's just say really embarrassing, low quality videos, uh, like really poor quality microphone, uh, poor quality like uh, lighting and uh, for some reason, like, I was shocked to get even 100 views every now and again. And uh, yeah, and what actually got me a little bit more views was, like, thanks to Barbara, um, uh, who uh, uh, just kind of, like, sh gave a shout out to me. And, like, I got a bunch more followers after that. So, pretty cool. So, would you say, like, when you started out your political commentary or just your commentary in general, you were kind of looking to sort of just see where it goes and grow and like figure out how it felt for you or were you going with a general plan because i know some people go into this and they're like i've always wanted to do this i've always wanted to get involved in politics or public discourse or an online career was that the case for you or was it just a little more like treading the waters a little bit oh i mean i did want to start youtube for a while now because i in general i really uh love acting like ever since i was a kid i wanted to do acting um, so I thought, hey, maybe I can like kind of have a, a mixture of that with politics. And I wasn't trying to get anywhere with it. I wasn't trying to become super popular or anything, but I was just hoping that I would get at least somewhere. Uh, I was hoping they would get at least K subs, which I'm still not at yet. <laughs> it's been so many years, so, but it's fine. And I, I just wanted to get somewhere with it, but I didn't want to become like this big star. And I didn't, I just didn't want to be uh, a failure at, at it as well. Yeah. And like, for me, it's a bit weird because for me, I've always thought of like politics as the main thing. Cause when I originally went to college, uh, I went in there with the complete mind of going into, uh, purely political stuff. Political science was my only major. I wasn't planning to get distracted on anything. I just jumped into it. Screw the gen eds. Let's get into the political stuff. 
And it had kind of come from a, a somewhat similar uh, but different point of view was, here's what I want to do because I enjoy it. I might not succeed, but I'm going to try. Uh, and I started out with writing. So I know you've written articles, and so it kind of got that same thing. Um, but what about like the 2016 election really got you into this kind of like online commentary, aside from the fact that he was a bit, you know, crazy? <laughs> I mean, at the time, I just was kind of shocked that someone uh, like him was actually able to win. Uh, I wasn't a very political person at the time. I was leading to, uh, before I was like considering myself a centrist, I was leaning more liberal. And uh, around that time, I was a bit shocked and I didn't really like him in the beginning. And then like, sadly, after a while, I started to be interested in him because I do like humor and he was really funny. Uh, so that was like uh, getting like myself more involved in that uh area but then i started getting like i started diving into like being a fan of jordan peterson uh i started watching people like mark dice and ben shapiro and i started realizing that i really don't know shit <laughs> i don't know what i'm talking about i'm pretty naive i allowed a bunch of people that are very confident in their demeanor to to alter my opinions on things and and that's how i got into so many arguments with my dad um uh, in the beginning because my dad's very political uh, and he would lean himself more in, in the progressive like uh, area, and I wasn't at that time. And after a while, I started to <laughs> uh, be disillusioned with like people like Jordan Peterson. Um, and that was like funny enough. It was when I took decided to take a bit of a break from politics. Uh, I took a break from my channel. I took a break from even thinking about politics. And uh, around that time, I started seeing more and more like progressive like opinions on my on my timeline on Twitter. Uh, because I use Twitter the most. <laughs> if anyone's aware of it, I use Twitter so much. And uh, the one thing that that really helped me look like look through everything was Jordan Peterson. And uh, oh, it was just like I forgot exactly what it was that he did. But there was just something that just went. This doesn't make sense. So I I posted an opinion of, uh, about it. And all these like Jordan Peterson fans that were following me were like, "No, you're wrong," and like you know mm -hmm. just like shaming me for it. And after a while, I started to like, uh, I think it was like actually thanks to uh, Angie Moon, uh, because I was talking to her a lot about this. And after a while, I started to change a bit of opinions. And I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. I'll be honest, I hate to admit this. I was this one person that used to think climate change wasn't an issue. <laughs> and then like, I actually did research and went, oh, shit. Sorry if I'm swearing. I don't know. No, you're it's you're good. I had Rico on here, okay. and I didn't have any bleep edited, so he's okay. the reason I've got a bleep thing set up that I can edit in afterwards. So you're good. Okay, good. I don't know if you've seen Trailer Pipe Boys, but let's just say I'm like a I'm like Rico. I love that. I love, I, I love swearing, and so yeah, I just got get a jalapeno. <laughs> jalapeno chips. Oh god, I love it. But well, yeah, like I, I just um. One of the issues I had was just this person that was blindly following other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. And when I started actually taking the time to research, something I noticed that was wrong about me was, and it's something that Hunter Avalon said as well. Hunter Avalon was saying that he used to just like stay away from all other types of politics whatsoever, like, because he was afraid of like looking at it. No, my opinion's right. I, I refuse to. And that's what I was doing. So, but though it made me feel really uncomfortable inside of mm -hmm. myself, I would click on someone else's channel and just listen to them speak. Then just like look at the sources that they had in their channel and like look up other information. And that's when I started to change. When I told them about my my change and how it like uh, it, it came about, all these Jordan Peterson fans unfollowed me and called me a traitor. <laughs> oh jeez. So that was funny. Um, and uh, I. Once again, I didn't care. Uh, at that point, I was like, well, you know, I don't have um, uh, much to lose at this point. Uh, it would have been worse for me if I continued do going down that route. And I think I'm in a better place now because, like, at that time, I was in a bad place. I was denying who I was. That's why it was so easy. I was like, uh, like I'm one of the good ones. And oh, like, God. I'm, and I was thinking that way. And now I'm a bit more like... Yeah, fuck that. Uh, I'm gonna stick to my principles, and I actually feel much better because I'm helping out other people. Yeah, and, and yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, and I and I I haven't talked about this. I don't think ever on my stuff, but uh, I used to have like I wouldn't say a Sargon of a Cod phase, like early Sargon when he was like 
just talking about creationists and things like that and also like being slightly cri more critical of like feminists but it was a weird thing because I never really got into that moment where I was saying things like feminism is a bad thing I just thought there was something wrong with this particular group of feminists and after a while it was like how many times can you say feminism bad over and over again before you start like questioning things and it sounds like you had a similar experience in that you followed these people because they helped you kind of make sense of a crazy world that you were interested in but as time went on their answers no longer satisfied the changing realities that you were seeing in a sense yes like um it made me realize that i was looking at things in a completely different lens like if you look at anything like uh uh feminist cringe uh it, a lot of the times like after a few years they would show the same feminist over and over again and i started to go wait a minute like <laughs> If they're so crazy, why is it always the three people that are like from like 2015 or something that you're keep showing? You're not showing anything else. And uh, I noticed that uh, it was getting worse over time because I was seeing people like uh, uh, say these like things about uh, black people. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, like you're claiming that you're not racist yet. There's this going on, and it was just like it, it, the the thing is it just led to these things and i i know like the way my values is met i, I can't go that far yeah so mine it was pretty much like i'm an idiot person who thinks that climate change is not real and that uh, feminists are crazy uh but like <laughs> man i saw people like I, there was someone that used to, that interviewed me a couple years back uh at that time he was a jordan peterson fan and he was like thinking like oh we need to have conversation with different people and just recently not too long ago, I saw a, a, a post, a comment he made underneath a Lauren Chen tweet uh, because she tweeted about like uh, the, the trans flag being like uh, uh, shown somewhere. And she's like, this is horrible. And, oh, like, God. Ah. and like he wrote underneath that we need to start a war. And I was like, wait, like an actual war or what, what was he? He, he said that he, we need to start a war against the leftists. Oh, God. Like, it, it got to the, like, I, I've known this guy. I've known him to be someone who was like, oh, I have these opinions and I share them, but we need to, like, talk about this, to, like, literally thinking that we should go against, against each other. And it's, like, it's so scary that I thought about, like, if I never looked at any other content, could I have gone that way? Mm. I, I, I think no, but there's always that possibility. Like, you really never know. And, well, I'm, I'm proud of myself, honestly. <laughs> well, and, and it takes a lot of a lot of courage to, I think, admit that you've made mistakes, not only in like who you've uh, like listened to or rather who how you listen to somebody versus uh, just like saying you were an idiot. You're in my opinion, you're, you're most certainly not. It sounds to me like you were trying to find an explanation for the craziness in the world, as many people were back then. And you started to realize very quickly that maybe the ex these explanations were not as they once were. But on, on that last note, when you commented about how you were denying yourself, I know you work a lot with indigenous rights. Uh, I believe it was Doctors of the World that you work with. Has that ever translated over into like your, your work and your YouTube? Or is it more two separate lives you kind of live with that kind of commentary? Uh, that's a good question. I feel like it kind of is connected because uh, the two things that I was trying to get away from uh, was, first of all, uh, well, there's several things actually. I, I'm bisexual and I was actually did an interview once where it was kind of clear that the guy was trying to like uh, come off by saying that I was one of the good ones. Oh God. I never really thought of it at the time until I read it over and I'm like, wait a minute, this kind of sounds like he's just saying other bi people are, are weird, <laughs> but like I'm the sane one. And I, that made me feel pretty uncomfortable. And again, with like indigenous rights, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm an indigenous person myself, but I'm not very cultural, which is true. I'm not a very cultural person. Like I was taking too much of like this, I'm just like a city native and like, therefore I'm like the other people. And it's just, it's so disgusting how I was thinking. Uh, I was making apology uh, apologies for people like Jordan Peterson, who were saying like uh, uh, who who made this incredibly racist tweet against an indigenous person at one point, um, and I was making like uh, excuses for that, and I was like, why am I doing this? You know, just because I don't believe in cultural appropriation at the time that I should be mad at other people who do, and it's like 
it's just a really a, a really ignorant way of looking at things and it kind of ties into what i'm doing now because now that i'm fully uh, accepting of who i am i feel like that's when i can actually help people um and that's why i want to help the indigenous uh, community because i am indigenous myself like i'm from that community i'm Mi'kmaq, and i feel like if i can do that i can be a bit more closer to not only my own identity but helping other people as well who might be facing a, a crisis within that identity. And I worked in the youth council uh, uh, a couple years back, and I was surrounded by people who were thinking very similar to me. At, you know, they, and I'll be honest, still to this day, I feel like I have moments where I don't feel like I'm, I mean, look at me, I'm very racially ambiguous. There's a lot of people that think I'm Hispanic, like a plenty of people who think I'm Hispanic. And then there's other people that think I'm Asian. So it's like, it kind of makes me wonder like even one guy recently came up to me who was native and said are you hispanic and it's like it makes you feel a bit disconnected from who the reality um and i there was someone i'm not going to mention who it is but someone who was native told me that i wasn't truly who i was uh because i'm i'm not as cultural as them so there's a lot of that with the, the language as well. You don't know the language, you're not really, uh, uh, you're not really native. And it's like, it's pitting each other against each other. And that's just, just awful. It's just awful behavior. So it was like, even when you're trying to help people and things like that, you still feel this sense of exclusion, either internalized from like communities and not being accepted. But at the same time, you also have instances in which others overtly don't accept you just because they don't, you don't fit their definition that they predetermine for themselves yeah definitely but it's also it, it's not just in the indigenous community it's elsewhere it's like it's everywhere that regardless of uh, of what race someone is they're just gonna like deny who you are because they look at you and they think oh you must be this because that's what you are you know i had a guy cross the street once uh to, to tell me that i was i must be asian and that i can't be anything else oh my lord um so it's like <laughs> It's like hearing those type of things, you're just like, oh my God, then what am I? Uh, and it makes you feel like, it makes you feel like crap, honestly. And yeah. I'm not going to pretend that I'm like super 100% proud of who I am. I'm still struggling, but I feel like that's a good thing because I, I feel like it helps like uh, uh, when I'm talking to someone, right? Like if I'm talking to someone that's struggling with the same thing, I'll be like, look, I, I, I struggle with it too. But you know, like, I know some tools that can help. Mm. And, and I've noticed that whether it's a, a community that has some sort of disadvantage in society, either by virtue of extensive prejudice, systemic or otherwise, or just a general misrepresentation of those people in the media, there's a certain percentage of that community that feels, or even the entirety of that community, sometimes feels as though they're uh, not up to par. Like for me, I have sometimes trouble seeing myself as equal to others because I have some mental disabilities and I have a history of uh, medical issues in the past that have kind of played a role. And it's, it's, it's sad to see because for all the challenges that come with being within certain groups, there's also a lot of strength because you have to push up against things that are frankly trying to put you down. Now, I wouldn't say that like my experiences are exactly the same as yours, but it is it is interesting to see that kind of pattern. But to circle back to what you were mentioning earlier about your political journey and how that kind of tied into your uh, your experience as an indigenous indigenous person, would you how would you describe yourself politically and what would you say about your experiences has influenced you to sort of adopt that political label if you have one definitely going to answer that but i just want to ask you really quick uh do you hear the, uh, outside my window <laughs> no i do not okay okay because i was like i'm gonna have to close it because i keep hearing like cars going by and i felt really bad and i'm like <laughs> you're good you're good um okay perfect uh so it definitely ties in uh, uh I, so first of all i was uh i voted for justin trudeau at the time um because he was the only person at the at the time was like actually going to look into the inquiry and i'm like oh that's that's really great but like looking back at what he's done <laughs> let's face it he has not done uh, much for the indigenous community 
and we feel like we were failed. And part of that is why I started to get into this like centrist mentality because I felt like I was failed by the other party. Uh, but but here's the deal, like that's the problem with like when we look at people that uh, follow Candace Owens, uh, they feel like they were uh, uh, they they had their back turns again uh, turned against them uh, with the Democratic Party. So they think that the Repu- uh, can you speak Republican Party would do that for them. And it's like let's face it, like these parties. In my opinion, so when you talk about my opinion, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Mm-hmm. But in my opinion, uh, especially when it comes to indigenous, uh, uh, like, uh, and rights, it, it's just we keep getting let down mm. in every corner. And that's why I feel like I consider myself more of a leftist uh, in, in my political uh, leanings. Um, I'll be honest, I, I don't want to label myself anything more because of just my history. Yeah. I, I don't like I call I called myself a centrist before I almost got to the point where I might call myself a conservative I don't like doing that to myself I was just like saying I'm this person and I'm and I have these certain opinions and I just don't want to label myself because I just feel like part of me is like oh am I just leaning somewhere too much because of this and it's like look let's face it I I hate to I hate to admit it because I can't stand her but I'm kind of like shoe in a way where I don't know much <laughs> I'll, I'll face it I'm not a very smart person and I'm going to be open with it. But here's the difference. Uh, I'm not out here making fun of people. I'm I'm out here trying to do better. I, I'm just trying to do something. And if my political leanings are not like 100% amazing to some other people, uh, she may not, um, I might not be knowledgeable in other aspects. Uh, one of the things I'm definitely knowledgeable of is uh, what indigenous people deserve, what they need, what they're lacking. And I, that's what I want to do. Uh, I, I kind of had a, like this, um, there's a few people in, uh, that saw me as this person that rehabilitates people or something. And I, I was shocked when someone told me that. I'm like, what? And it's because I was like talking to former extremists uh, uh, and interviewing them. But I never wanted to see myself on the same level of people like Vosh, you know? That's just not who I am. I, I, this is not what I'm trying to be. I don't, I'm not here to like change people's minds, honestly, because I'm just really suck at that. Uh, I'm a very opinionated person. I'm, I'm very... Uh, forward with my responses um and i feel like i work better when i work with other people uh so i work with like other uh intervention workers uh, social workers people who work like outreach workers that work in this particular field uh that can find solutions to uh help out uh the indigenous population and the homeless population uh because when it ties into the indigenous stuff just looking at like uh, I know I live in Montreal, but just in general, when you look at like um, uh, areas like in the city, there's a high population of Indigenous people that are facing homelessness. So and oh sorry, oh, yeah, go ahead. There was no, a del- go ahead. <laughs> there was I'm a delay in the audio. <laughs> no, you're good. It's good. It's good. Uh, I yeah, I've kind of I was just curious because like in my experience, a lot of my political journey was tied to disability rights. So one of the organizations I worked with here. Uh, in America is Disability Rights Iowa when I was still out in Iowa. Uh, And the thing that always kind of made me feel a little more sure of myself was being able to get to in-person issues that affected the community I was most familiar with in a way that really allowed me to feel confident in myself. I'm guessing that's kind of where you were kind of describing, where it's like, here's what I know, here's where I'm at, and here's how I can grow. Definitely, because I don't want people to get the wrong intention that like uh, I am this person that knows everything and I don't like to step on in any capacity where I don't know anything like I don't know much about um, let's say like gun rights and anything of that factor so I'm not gonna like just step my toes in there and be like I have an opinion on this it's like I just don't feel like that's right uh, I feel like I have to like um, know my place in a sense like I don't want to beat it like <laughs> like you know your place woman but like I want to know my place and and my place is like um, uh, when it comes to like the homeless population and the indigenous population that's what I know best uh, so I want to stick with that and that's why like um, I'm hoping that in the future I can start getting like uh, I can start working more and more in this field where it could be like working in government or working in another uh, another place doing intervention work uh, it must be for that I feel like a, a part of my strength especially is uh, helping out uh, women that are suffering from like sexual assault 
Um, so that's just my, my main focuses at the current moment. Like I have so many focuses, honestly. <laughs> a bit like too many that. projects to keep up with, right? Yeah, I started a committee uh, last year um, that works with um, uh, finding solutions uh, and raising awareness on the amount of overdoses that happened during the pandemic and the sexual assaults that are happening as well. Uh, and that is a lot of work because you're just like just doing research and you're like talking to other people and you're seeing how like incredibly how much it just went above and beyond your way of thinking like you just heard one person talk about like sexual assault that happened here and then it just leads to so many other things that you didn't know um and it's terrifying uh it leads to like sex trafficking as well and that like there's a lot of indigenous women that are involved in, uh, unfortunately in the sex trafficking industry uh, you know, they're, they're, we've heard about women being taken away in a, in a van, you know, uh, so it's just like a lot of things like that, that it messes with you because not only am I working, uh, because part of my job initially is, uh, working with, uh, the mobile clinic that helps people who are in the area, uh, that may need help that, you know, have trouble accessing, uh, um, uh, basic cares and in, like other institutions. Um, and we also do a lot of outreach work. So we carry our backpack with a lot of harm reduction materials. We walk around, we talk to people, we see how they're doing. Uh, and a part of me was like, I want to do more. Because when we talked to people outside, we were hearing these stories. You know, we would hear that someone um, uh, took a drug that was laced with like a lot of fentanyl. And then like we would, uh, we would hear about uh, a woman, uh, an indigenous woman getting beat up and left in the street naked. Oh, this was happening a lot in uh, the downtown area. Uh, we were hearing about uh, one man was lacing uh, 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 women's beers with like GHB. Um, oh my God. And there was, it was just really incredible, like how much stuff we have heard. And like, I, I was coming, going home and like in tears sometimes. And, I, and like, I didn't know what to do with myself. Uh, and then that's how I started the committee. Cause I was like, I had enough. So I contacted various different like uh, organizations uh, in the downtown area. And then I started learning more and more about what's been going on. Uh, and that led to like us, like I was on CBC, uh, uh, radio like twice to talk about like our committee to talk about what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to have like more safer consumption sites set up, uh, for, uh, specifically women, um, more culturally respective ones as well. And we would like to, we were trying to get a clothing bin started up for women as well. Uh, since a lot of women were left on the street naked and uh, we wanted to start workshops with like um, uh, Naloxone trainings um, like boundaries um, like just like self-defense courses as well so we're trying to get all of that set up yeah and like just listening to you I don't know if you notice but like just listening to the things you describe like it's infuriating to just hear second hand or rather third hand because you heard it from them and then to me but so I guess what I would bluntly ask, how do you manage to conduct so many different things, deal with such intense stories, and still maintain a sense of uh, inner peace, if you will, when you're still knowing that you're going to have to keep working on this kind of thing while also pursuing your ambitions? Oof, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a really tough question there, man, because <laughs> like, uh, I had to think really hard and, and think to myself, like, do I really have inner peace? And I'll be honest, like, uh, well, f first of all, we do have services for us to like talk to someone uh, when we need it. Um, so I actually see a therapist on the side for like anything personal related. Uh, and then I also have uh, a psychologist that I that I see like uh, once every two weeks uh, that is like from my job. And we talk about these things because it's not just this, you know, there's times like uh, there's a few times like I remember one time I saw someone uh, pass out from an overdose in front of me. Uh, and I remember just crying at that time because I just couldn't deal with it. And I wanted to make sure he was okay. And I'm like, I kept asking, is he okay? And um, I do remember that time I was in a, a group meeting at work uh, last year and just finding out that someone that we were uh, uh, doing a follow-up on was found dead. And it's just those type of things. I just, I guess part of it, part of the things that help is just knowing that there's people that are grieving with you. Uh, we did have a grieving, uh, grieving circle at one point, uh, where we just like sat in the grass and just like surrounded each other, uh, and just talked about all the people that passed away. Cause like, it's just, it felt like one after the other. And every time I would hear it, I'm like, oh my goodness, who else died? You know? Yeah. It's like, a, it's like 
you, you can only take so much before you have to let it out because otherwise it just it it builds up and it takes everything from you and uh, I gotta say talking helps I, I mean definitely helps for me I think everyone has different coping strategies and I, I can't speak on behalf of other people but like I think what helps me the most is talking to people about it like how I'm talking to you right now um, uh, getting a chance to talk to like my, my psychologist my therapist uh, talk to my family even about how I'm feeling and just like staying away from politics sometimes online because I'm dealing with a lot and sometimes like that's why if you look at my Twitter uh, there's less and less politics because I can't handle it. <laughs> it's just like I really can't. But if I if I put that on my shoulders as well, I'm just I think I'm going to explode. Yeah, because like, when you say inner peace, I don't feel like I'm at inner peace yet. Honestly, I have my moments, but <laughs> yeah. Well, and and the thing like that strikes me is, and I have to say, like the amount of control you have just in being able to talk about this is commendable, and you have my eternal respect on that regard that's that's not something you deal with on an easy basis and something that you want to go back to additionally is um something that i've i rarely ever have heard like somebody talk about these things and say no i want to go back um no it's like one of those things where you look at this and you see all these things around you and you know what you have to do for yourself but at the same time you're still going and is there a particular thing that drives you to want to not only get engaged more, but also to um, build upon the systems that you've already worked on? Because I know you mentioned you built a committee uh, to help with overdoses and things like that. There's several things, honestly. Uh, one of the things I told myself in my life is that, because um, I'll be honest, I fear death. And when I hear that someone passed away, that just reinforces that, like, oh my goodness, it's like, it's going to happen, right? And part of me knows that like probably uh, I know everyone thinks differently but it was a very big possibility once you die nothing else happens and it's just like you're dead and I I know that it's not going to mean much probably but I don't care if I die people else will uh, other people will continue to live I don't want them to just I've been through hell in my life and I don't want people to feel the same way so a part of me wants to know that when I pass away I did as much as I can to help other people and because I want people, I don't want people to feel bad too much when I when I die. I want people to go, you know what, Amanda helped me, and I want to help another person. Mm. And then it's just going to lead into this chain of like other people helping each other, and that's what I want. And, and I want people to be happy. I want people to continue pursuing their their dreams. And the other things that helps too is um, I was following this uh, couple actually uh, for several months, and. Um, uh, when I when I was working with them, I remember the first time I met them. Uh, the woman, she was just feeling really sick. She was over drinking, and she had a pain in her side. And I'll be honest, I had some drinking problems in the past. So like when she told me about that, I knew right away what it was. And I'm like, oh man, like I I felt like I was seeing myself in a sense. And I talked to her, and I talked to her boyfriend at the time, and I was like, you know, I, I just like I. One thing I know, maybe intervention workers don't work the same way, but I'll be honest and straight up, I'll tell people that I suffered from this as well, because I want them to feel like, you know, someone else out there has, has felt this. And she was too afraid to go to the hospital because it was around a pandemic, and uh, she knew that he wasn't going to be able to accompany her, and uh, so, like, I was doing a lot of follow-ups with her, and that was, like, our first time actually meeting was a, this, this big intervention, right? And then, like, Months later, you know, I'm following up and I, I find out that uh, they're getting a place and she has been sober. Um, last time I spoke with her for about 70 days and like he was working on his sobriety as well. And like uh, and they're going through all these things. And I'm just like, and I actually went home one day and cried because I was so happy. And I know that you can't help everyone, but like just seeing like what happened and like everyone worked together. That's what we do. We don't just do one person works in like one. No, we like working together. If we can't do something, we talk to our other uh, intervention worker and be like, okay, how are we going to do this? And uh, he thanked me and he said, look, like, I, I don't know how to thank you. Like you just helped me with all this. And it, it, it made me realize there was a project going on at the time as well, where they talked to and interviewed like uh, people who uh, live in the street and, and get their experiences. 
And he said he wanted to talk to them because he wanted to help out anyone else who would be listening that may be going through the same thing. And I'm just like, you see, that's what I want. And it's incredible to see that. Just go through it and see another person that you helped go and help another person. And uh, there was another, there's another lady as well we continue to follow up with. And in the beginning, like she was, she just terrified to go to hospitals because like of the treatment she had there. And like just seeing like uh, how much she has changed. Like I just, uh, I had coffee with her uh, right before um, uh, I went on like uh, my vacation. And just the confidence she had in her demeanor was so different to, to the, the first time I met her. So those things keep me going, you know? So in a way, it's sort of like you actually get to see the fruits of your labor constantly like going on and on. And those little moments seem to make that struggle all the more um, all the more beneficial and helpful emotionally, not just for you, but for people long after you literally know your effect on the people around you. And that that to me is like fascinating because a lot of people, myself included, tend to wonder, you know, what happens to me when I'm gone? Uh, but nobody, very rarely actually, very few people are asking, okay, what happens to everybody else when I'm gone? Uh, and to see like somebody, and this is me off the cuff, seeing somebody say, hey, what happens to everybody else when I'm gone, speaks tremendously to uh, to the dedication you have to your work. But I'm, I'm going to shift this a little bit into uh, the recent news. And you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I know this is probably traumatic for a lot of people. But as you are aware, there have been discoveries surrounding uh, those graves at the uh, the residential schools where a lot of them died of tuberculosis. Uh, more than twice, I believe it was, the rate at which standard Canadians, like everyday Canadians, lived in who weren't you know, the non-Indigenous population. And I was wondering, how has your work kind of been affected by that? Because a lot of Indigenous people have rightfully felt an intense amount of fury at what they're, what's pretty much been a well-known thing for so long. Oh, boy. Uh, it definitely affected my work. Uh, first of all, this uh, news came around uh, around a time that I was the only person working in that particular field, like in uh, my work, because like my coworker went on vacation uh, for a month. So I spent that time just like going, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do half the time. I was busy working a lot with uh, a few other people, so I didn't have much time to do as much outreach. Uh, but like we've seen, we still seen like the impact it had within the community. Because not only that this is going on, we already saw uh, the past two years in this community, people that have passed on. And everyone was just like disgusted, right? Because yeah. not only did this news come out, we have people just already still to this day fighting indigenous people and, and having like just trying to get them like to, to move. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, there's this one particular area um, uh, right near a shelter where a lot of indigenous people uh, reside because they have nowhere else to go. And a lot of the people in the area were complaining about it. So they put up a fence to stop them from being in a particular like uh, lot. And then they were hanging around near the fence. So they built another area around the fence. So they have like, uh, you know, they only have the sidewalk. That's like, this is all happening around a time when everyone's just still grieving when it came to this. Like, look, indigenous people knew what happened. Like, we weren't just, like, shocked like everyone else. We knew about this. Like, we, we've had sto we, we've known people who were in it, or we've, we've heard stories about it. Like, we knew about this. But a, a big portion of the population, sadly, doesn't know about it, uh, or ha didn't know about it, uh, because they weren't taught about it. Like... Uh, when I went to school, the only time uh, we were actually taught about this, and I already knew about it, but no one else did, was in a class because the teacher decided to talk about it. Mm. And everyone just got shocked. And I'll be honest, that definitely struck me was when I had one kid say, are they extinct? And I laughed because I was in that classroom. And... But... Just seeing how angry he got though after when he heard this news and everyone in the class got angry and was like what the how did i not know about this like and it just made people angry and and sadly i know people would be like i don't want people to be angry i want people to be angry i really do 
And I, it's not because I want them to suffer. I just, I don't see any change happening if we're not angry. Because that's how I felt when this happened, when I started doing like the committee and everything. If I wasn't angry about this, I wouldn't have started this. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been in the press conference, you know, I wouldn't have been talking on CBC radio about this. But like, I was angry, so I did something about it. And that's what other people need to do. They need to get angry. They need to understand how disturbing this is. And we still have people denying the genocide. And oh my goodness, Lance from the Serbs did an incredible like breakdown of the term genocide and how it's still linked to a lot of what indigenous people are facing. And people still don't get it. Like he, he broke it down in ways that I, I definitely can't because I just get too angry just thinking about it. But like he actually took the time to be like, hey, these are the terms of genocide. Here are how these things are still happening currently to indigenous people. Therefore, equal genocide. And people yeah. are like, nope, nope. And, and that also takes a toll on all of us as well, because uh, sadly, uh, it doesn't happen often, but like we still have people being like racist when we're doing our job. Uh, there was one guy, too, that was like, oh, you're just going to round up all the Indians, right? Like the junk Indians, not knowing that we were indigenous ourselves. Oh, and Jesus. We have to deal with that stuff. We have to deal with people just being like, oh, can you just get them beat or such drunks? And I have to explain to people, like, the, here's one thing I always say to people, too. Um, unless you're, like, just a sociopath or something, but, like, if anyone had uh, to, to understand it, people have to think of one person, regardless of what race they are. Don't think of them even be having a race. Just one person that has been through uh, physical torment, uh, sexual assault, starvation, experimentation, being denied who they truly are. For years and then you just leave them without any therapy or nothing and just be like good luck and then see what's gonna happen that person's most likely going to have um, to suffer from depression and suicide uh, suicidal ideation this person's more likely going to probably become abuser themselves or they're gonna or they're going to drink a lot they're gonna do something right these things are very common when you think of someone who has been through trauma so if someone can comprehend that basic thing why do they have trouble comprehending that this that all of these people that have went through something similar as an entire race of people are on the street more often drinking more often uh uh there's a high rate of suicide among their men like this is this, this is what's happening <laughs> because no sorry no shit <laughs> yeah you're like, good there's that clear link behind it but that's why a lot of people don't think of that because uh the government didn't you know there's no like mandate to teach anyone about this. It's like only, hey, if you're a, uh, a progressive teacher that wants to teach this, they're, they're going to do it. But that meant a lot of people having no idea. People just going wigwams and longhouses. That's all they knew. And then it stopped. That's why there's a lot of people that thought we were extinct or, or that we don't do anything or we're just on the street doing nothing. And I analyze this a lot. I'm sorry I'm talking a lot. No, you're good. You're, <laughs> that's exactly what I want. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, one thing I analyzed, especially, uh, was why people always assume that we're drunk and that we're living on the street, that we're lazy, that we don't do anything. Well, because that's what they see. They only see that side of us. Um, so, like, if you look at, if you think of it, uh, first of all, a lot of us are in other communities that are far away. They're city natives, but we blend in. But why do they not look at us? Like, why, do they, why am I not walking down the street and someone says, you're a native? No, they, they categorize me as a Hispanic or they categorize me as an Asian because they are used to seeing Hispanic and Asian people walking among us and they're used to uh, the, uh, the understanding that that's what Hispanic and Asian people do, that they live among us and they have jobs. But they look at the person on the street and go, oh, that's just a native, I don't know, he's drunk. Um, because that's what the government, you know, shows us as. You know, they were saying that uh, indigenous women are ugly that's a very common thing as well. Oh, indigenous women are ugly. They have no teeth. And like, uh, I have all my teeth. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm super ugly here. I look pretty decent. So it's like, so I must be categorized within another group. And that's really sad. That's what, that's what they were trying to, that's what they sadly uh, uh, got a, a lot of people to think. Uh, to think that that is what, who we are. And anyone who doesn't uh, look like that must be from another community. Um, and this is clearly done on purpose. It's clearly done on purpose. And we need to break that system. And that's why I'm so glad that we're seeing more representation over time of like, 
of indigenous people and very attractive indigenous people that are in modeling careers and etc that actually have jobs because shocker we do work <laughs> and it's like and, and, and it's a way of like just changing that like uh mentality that a lot of people have sadly it's still people think that way and that's why there's people that would come up to me and be like no you can't be native you can't be <laughs> it's just, you saw what happened to lance too yeah uh because like a lot of people think he's white passing so people were like no you must be white because this is how you look this is how you act you must be this it's yeah. depressing yeah. It, it almost seems as though there's like a mystification of not only the past of indigenous people but the present in which they become separate from society like you described um but in a way that is almost it's almost like they treat uh, indigenous people like they live in another dimension uh in a way because there's this line of separation from the way in which they talk about people that just seems indescribable yet somehow like very real like it's it's a weird thing to to witness and you've you've probably you've definitely got more experience than I do with this, but I am curious how does that sort of feeling of separation contribute to indigenous people's uh, interactions not just with their government but with particular individuals uh, in the government like Trudeau like you mentioned. It's really sad because I uh, when you I have to mention as well that, that there's this lateral violence that happens as well. uh, and it's just. It's depressing. It's like it's like colorism, for example, right? Like you, you've been told for like generations that you're, you're that you're nothing and that you need to be more white. Uh, so there's a lot of people that have tried to like, and this is not just with the indigenous community. There, it's it's with the Asian community. It's with the black community that we have to blend in with society in, in the way that they want us to. Uh, and uh, I think it was like at a certain time we weren't even allowed to like dance our traditional dances because that was like illegal. <laughs> it's like. My goodness, like we couldn't do things that were, uh, because they deemed it like unappealing or, or like unlike Christian or something, you know, like it's like unwhite, like you guys are different than us, and it, it still affects people to this day. And like some people, like, um, might not want to admit that, but I'll be perfectly honest that is something that we still that the community still has to deal with the acceptance of ourselves because for generations we have been told that we're nothing. Uh, and that we have to be more like other people and what's sad about that is that if you're trying to be yourself too uh like for example like me or lance it's like well you're not really indigenous because you're not as cultural you see and that, it kind of dives into that whole mentality it's all linked to the whole white supremacy mentality and sadly it got it got linked into people uh people of color like indigenous people and asian people and black people because it was ingrained into our minds that we must be like them and and it's just disturbing so when we when we dive into like uh the community and how we like uh we feel amongst each other i'm seeing a big shift not gonna lie. like this is my opinion this I, i'm definitely seeing a huge shift in how people are uh feeling about themselves i'm seeing more and more proud people standing up and and, and just just in general, like I know it's a purist, um, I'm talking about aesthetics as well, but we're seeing more and more people like uh, with like their traditional uh, garb that are like going out there and they're being very representative of who they are as a native person. And that's because we're seeing more and more people pri uh, that are proud of it. They're getting out there and they're like, I am native. Look at me, you know? And it's just so incredible to see that because uh, I felt like for a while, including myself, I felt like I, I was shy. I had to like, you know, look down. I had to like, you know, I, I felt like shit for, for what I look like in the past. I went to an all like mostly white elementary school looking like I do. I am definitely not white passing. I got made fun of for my nose, for my eyes. You know, your eyes are too small and you know, my skin tone. It's like it's just but we're seeing more and more of that come out where the pride is there and we're seeing a huge shift because people know people like justin trudeau are not our it's not our ally we know that people the republicans are not our allies we know these people are not truly indigenous allies because they don't want the same things that indigenous people uh value so for example we we really care about the climate 
do do they <laughs> do they really no they care about profit they care about profit and that's not what we are that's not who we are as a people we care about the environment we care about the other people so uh it goes ag directly against the, their their way of thinking that's why it was such a huge threat and i know people don't people will think maybe i'm crazy for saying that but like honestly indigenous people are a threat for that very reason because our values and principles go against the very nature of what society currently is and and, and it, that's what it is that's why that's why they hate us so much <laughs> and that's why they don't want us in power <laughs> and it kind of seems to me like and and you've described this perfectly it, that if you can't uh, get a people to fit into the, the box that they want them to like want people to be put into it's easier to just move them out of the entire system even if they uh, even if it's morally unacceptable in the face of one's own principles like uh, perhaps famously in the United States uh, Andrew Jackson's decision to move out the peoples that were living in Georgia uh, due to uh, the Indian Removal Act and the Supreme Court had explicitly told him that that was completely illegal and a violation of the treaties that had been signed. Well, Andrew Jackson allegedly said, the Chief Justice has given his decision, L let us see if he can enforce it, and went along with his own plans that resulted in countless deaths that were uh, completely, completely unnecessary and uh, completely immoral. But uh, I'd just like to ask you one question before we end the stream. Uh, what exactly do you think you'll be doing going forward in terms of content creation and would you will you be talking about these issues more on your channel or are you more interested now in just trying to get back into the swing of things in work and then trying to use your channel as sort of an extension of that at this moment uh i i don't have much time to like continue my channel every now and again because i am working a lot uh so I want my channel in a way to be an escape from that. That's why I, on Twitch, like I do a lot of like, um, um, like I do have political discussions here and there, but I also like playing video games and just having all around fun because I need to escape from that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still going to continue doing projects and it, and who knows, it might be linked uh, in the future with my channel. Um, uh, I mean, like, for example, like I was on Jody's uh, doing an interview. I'm currently on uh, doing an interview with you. And I was on Lance. Uh, uh, with, I was talking to Lance and uh, everyone as well. I want to continue doing things like that. And I'll never say no to it. But on a, on an, on a whole, I would like to just have fun with my channel uh, and talk politics every now and again. But I'm never stopping what I'm doing. Like, uh, I still want to go into acting and, and have fun with that. But I, I don't I don't see myself ever stopping like this fight. I just don't see it happening. Well, and I and I wish you all the best because this seems like a very difficult and oh, well deserved victory. Hopefully, the things get better. Uh, but thank you again for coming on my channel and discussing this with me. I know some of the topics were very heavy, and I really really appreciate you going into detail about your experiences. So thank you so much for being on here. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I wish I could talk more to you because this is really fun. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Also feel free to check out the podcast and Facebook page where you can find my videos, podcasts, and other work by me. Thanks again for watching and have a nice day.